Thank you for joining us, Dave. We're here in the Autos Academy, the new studio, and uh, we've, we've created this to give us a, a bit of an outlook to the clients and customers that we have within the new, the new norm, because we obviously can't get out to see people. So I really appreciate you doing this for us. Can you just say a little bit about who you are, what you do up at Scottish Ambulance, etc.? Hello, Maurice Craig, you're welcome. I'm glad to join you. I'm currently the, the lead consultant paramedic for the Scottish Ambulance Service. I've been with the service for about 25 years now. I'm on secondment into this current post, and the main part of this role is around ensuring that our clinical operational colleagues are enabled and have the, the ability to provide high-quality clinical care. And that's supported by a lot of policy development and strong clinical leadership throughout the organisation. My substantive role is a consultant paramedic with primarily responsibility for the ambulance services commitments to our national strategy for improving outcomes from out hospital cardiac arrest in Scotland. Thank you. Like I say, it's really appreciated. So 25 years, I think you've, you've beat me. I've got about 21 years in the, in the industry, but not in the same place. So that's fair commitment you from you. You look about 22 as well. <laughs> They'll feel it. So I think the biggest challenge we've faced um, as a service is some of the adaptions we've had to make in terms of new ways of working and the speed at which they had to happen for our colleagues to ensure they had the, the appropriate guidance, uh, some extra training and, and, and occasion some other pieces of equipment to allow them to continue providing high levels of clinical care, but also in the safest possible way to keep them safe and their patients safe. I guess some of the lessons we've learned and the process that we've put in place will continue, particularly in terms of uh, patient care pathways for different types of conditions where we've implemented them. They've been proven to be successful and they're likely to continue as we move forward and hopefully out of COVID. My, one of my favourite parts of the UK is Scotland. I absolutely adore it. A fantastic place. I love, love spending time up there personally and with work. It's a very challenging country, isn't it? Very challenging terrain up and down north of Edinburgh, you know, up, on, up into the, the Trossachs and north of Inverness, etc. What challenges come at this time of year for you guys? Things like the vehicles and the terrain and the weather. You've, you've got a plan, I imagine, pretty meticulously with vehicle prep and placing people in the right locations, etc. Probably from a UK point of view, I'd say it's the harshest winter months up in Scotland, it's fair to say. Um, you're right, uh, Scotland is, without a doubt, the most beautiful part of the UK, and you're right to love it. It's a great country. Um, it's got lots of fantastic scenery, it's got excellent cities, and it's very diverse. But yeah, in the winter, um, it can be particularly challenging for the ambulance service. We tend to see in call volume increases, uh, particularly around respiratory type illnesses and seasonal flu. Um, but this year, um, obviously we've had the, the challenges with COVID um, and we, we are actively recruiting and have recruited um, some uh, new staff to support our frontline operations and as well as that, our, our ambulance control rooms. We have a variety of four by four capable vehicles across the fleet. And as well as that, we've got support from our air ambulance division as well to get to those hard to reach places. And our special operations response team have a number of all terrain vehicles which can be used to support patients in hard to get to places. Um, and obviously we work very closely with other partners. So the mountain rescue teams, for example, there's a lot of those across Scotland. And also we work very closely with Coast Guard Search and Rescue. Um, so sometimes they can be utilized to, for example, mountain incidents where it wouldn't be safe or appropriate for our staff to deploy to. We work closely with Coast Guard Search and Rescue who may recover a patient in, uh, in partnership with Mountain Rescue and then bring them to a point where we can offer our clinical care to support the ongoing transfer to definitive care. So yeah, it's very much a partnership working across all emergency services to do the, the best we possible can for the patients regardless of where they happen to be. And I imagine the Scots being the Scots and you guys know how to celebrate Hogmanay, that'll uh, relieve a little bit of pressure at least this year, I would imagine, won't it? Princess Street will be a little bit quieter than normal. Yeah, sadly, for sure. Um, Hogmanay is consistently our busiest busiest night of the year and, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens this year. There'll be, there'll be none of the 
the public street party. So yeah, it's going to be very different, very different indeed. So in my personal opinion, I find that the device is very user friendly. It's fairly intuitive. When you're faced with a challenging situation, the easier a piece of equipment to use, the better it can be to make the situation less stressful. Mm -hmm. um, I find that the ability to separate the device has potential great advantages for certain groups of patients. So for example, a patient that trapped in a car at a road traffic accident where you can connect them up to the monitoring and then perhaps allow our fire service colleagues to continue the extrication, but standing back at a reasonable distance, you can still, you can still monitor the patient vital signs and be very quick to respond to any clinical deterioration. Um, the same can be done, I guess, in cardiac arrests as well. I mean, we've adopted this pick true style response to cardiac arrest, and by that I mean we, we allocate tasks to individual uh, clinicians and, and we try where possible, depending on the resources we sent to the patient. But ideally, we try to have some clinical leader, uh, so some, some leadership in terms of running the cardiac arrest. And by that, I mean allocating the tasks, um, controlling the, the resuscitation, ensuring everything is done appropriately at the appropriate time. And that person usually has a standoff approach, so they're not really hands-on. So allowing them to stand back again with the monitor to carry out that leadership role is, is is very useful. Another benefit is absolutely the, the ability for the clinical data to auto-populate from the Corpus 3 across to our EPR. Uh, and that, it does have some efficiency saving times and another useful concept. And again, in my personal opinion, one of the, it may sound a little silly, but one of the, the things I, I really quite like about the device is the, the elastic shoulder strap, which makes it, for me anyway, appears to be more comfortable and easier to carry around when you're uh, maneuvering in from the vehicle to the patient's house with perhaps some other pieces of kit as well. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. We, we, we show that to people quite often and we, we explain that it's the product's designed from the ground up to be a pre-hospital device, but you don't really see the benefits until you use it in anger, really, do you? Until you are in under pressure with all the other equipment and you need it to work first time. So it's, it's good to hear. So certainly I get an opportunity to, to speak to a lot of operational colleagues. My other half is a paramedic you know, Craig. So the informal feedback that I've had uh, would suggest that the populating accurate drug administration times is a very useful key feature. It's both efficient and, and it's related to patient safety as well. So we know exactly when a, a medicine has been administrated. A number of patient observations also ought to populate to the EPR. That kind of helps to improve efficiency as well. And I think the, the ability that we have to quickly change between our organization's predetermined settings for different conditions, so such as we've got a, a different setup for the for trauma patients on the monitoring screen to that of a cardiac patient or a medical patient. And, and they're very seamless and very slick. And of course, at any point if the patient suddenly deteriorates to cardiac arrest, just by one simple button, you can be straight into the, to the using the defibrillator Obviously, you still need to attach the defibrillator pads if they're not they're not already on the patient, but it's very seamless and it's quite slick. I'm arguably a bit of a tidy person, so I quite like the fact that the cable bundles are they're well laid out. They're very easy to find, and when you store them away, um, it's very difficult for you not to store them away tidily yeah, yeah, and yeah. keep them keep them easy for use for the next time. So. I find that particularly useful. You're a man after my heart, mate. Everything has a place, nice and tidy. The insight you're giving is absolutely fantastic. People watching this will get a brilliant vision of the service and the product seamlessly connecting together. Yeah, so the back end of uh, 2019, early 2020, so during the transition from our previous device to the Corpus 3, um, we had some film crew out with our colleagues across Scotland in different areas. That filming has been completed, it's currently actually being edited, and hopefully will be on screens later this year. Perhaps perhaps it might not be till January, we've not got a definitive date yet, but it'll be shown on uh, BBC Scotland 
and it'll be it'll be really interesting, I guess, for you guys to be able to to see your your device being used across Scotland. There's yeah. also next year there's plans for filming with Channel Four. They're looking to do a, a documentary looking at the Scottish trauma network system. So essentially looking at uh, from roadside to bedside, for one of a better term, there may be an opportunity for others to to see a greater insight to the the abilities of the Scottish Ambulance Service and how we interact uh, with various pieces of technology and equipment to benefit patient outcome. Fantastic. And uh, does that, we, we do a bit with, obviously Yorkshire Air Ambulance is one of our helicopter clients. Do the air ambulances up in Scotland feature in that or do they have a programme at all or not? I'm not sure. I suspect they'll feature in the next year's Channel 4 uh, programme where it's focusing around major trauma um, because some of our trauma teams uh, utilise our aircraft as a transport medium to get to and from patients and to transfer patients. So I suspect they'll definitely be involved next year. I'm not sure how much footage there has been with the Air Ambulance for the, the BBC. Right. I look forward to seeing all that. I love seeing the, seeing the system in use in action. Or opportunity to see parts of Scotland maybe that you've not seen before. I, or I might not be able to see for a while. So, yeah. We're an ambulance service who employs around 5,000 people. Um, just over 3,000 of those are operational clinicians. Uh, we serve a population of just over 5.5 million across many, many square miles. As you know, some urban city areas to many, many remote and rural uh, places, including islands. It was a massive project. And we have around about 650 uh, vehicles across the fleet. So this was a very logistically challenging migration project. Uh, we needed to ensure that all the staff training and the vehicle installation plan was well aligned. Uh, it needed to be executed to the minute so that we could minimize any impact uh, potential on our frontline services because obviously we, we needed to continue providing service. But there was fantastic and excellent teamwork between the project team within the ambulance service, within the wider ambulance service, and of course the supplier, you guys at Ortis, um, uh, the support that you gave to complete the project under pretty difficult circumstances coming towards the end because that was when we were uh, just seeing the beginning of COVID and the challenges around that. Yep, absolutely. No, it was challenging indeed. A, a number of highlights, but I think I'd like to kind of touch back to an infographic that was produced by my colleague Roslyn, who was a project manager during the project, and she put this infographic together to inform our, our board and internally, and it went in our Response Magazine, which is the internal uh, publication that goes to all ambulance uh, locations across Scotland. Uh, and it details a, a, a number of figures, and I'll read these out, because I, the, I wrote them down in case this question came up. So there's a huge amount of work went into this project. So there was 20 regional trainers who received training from, from yourselves at Ortis. Um, those trainers completed 15 ferry journeys, four flights, 28,500 logistical miles across Scotland. Uh, there was 528 vehicle installations done within 421 hours, and you issued 600 devices across the country. The training took place over 155 days, where we trained 3,029 staff across 75 different locations. It was a massive logistical challenge. However, the whole project was completed under budget and by the target completion date. So, uh, yeah, thanks to the whole project team, it was it was delivered exceptionally well. Yeah, it's uh, when you when you listen to the numbers back like that, and take into account everything we said about the challenges of Scottish, you know, the terrain and the weather. It's we we started it and the big ramp was right over winter last year, wasn't it? You know, it was it's a big challenge for everybody. It's a, it's a fantastic achievement when you when you listen to it back like that. The collaboration between us was key for that. I think we couldn't have done it in the situation we had without a close-knit team from all sides. Um, you know, from, so from, from your side, who do you think were the, the standout people within the trust for that on that project? It definitely wouldn't have progressed 
uh, with the professionalism and the expertise without Liam Gawkin, who headed up the, the, the project board. Rosalind Scott is the project manager, who I've already met, and Paul Kelly from a, the, the clinical input to that, as well as the many others in the wider team. They all work tirelessly to see the project through to completion. And again, as I said, it was in some real challenging times, winter pressures, uh, and then coming to the end of our winter pressures, we were coming into the first wave of COVID-19. Uh, but still, the project was completed on date, um, which was fantastic. But yeah, thanks to the, the whole team involved, uh, not just in the ambulance service, but to your colleagues at Ortis as well. No, oh, thank you. I'd, I appreciate that. And I'd, I'd echo your, your comments on that. And what better thing for a load of Scots people and a load of Yorkshire people to come on, on time and under budget, more importantly. The, the biggest challenge with things like that is vehicles and logistics, getting vehicles together, getting equipment, getting a team to fit it. That's the hardware, if you like, isn't it, that goes into the system. I see this as an ongoing project, as ever, ever evolving. Now it's settled in and it's the, the defib that's in use all the time on patients throughout Scotland. It's a very future-proof platform, I think. It's very, very flexible. You know, where, where do you see, with your other stakeholders in the service, moving with the product? As you say, yeah, there's... there's Still lots, there's lots left to do. There's lots left to do all the time. We're, we're continuously adapting service to improve improve patient care, in particular to the, the corpus device. The, the thing I want to see happening next is we, we uh, with the support from you guys, we need to improve the, the management of our data capture. There's lots and lots of data there. And I'm really looking forward to entering into this phase where we are being able to understand and share that data in particular for us to be able to feed back to our operational crews on how they've performed, identify perhaps themes for improving education or training, um, but using that data to, to essentially improve patient care and outcome is what we need to be doing next. 100%. Well, that, that's the whole aim of the game, isn't it, really, will it? From our point of view, we've got to adapt quite as a business quite quickly to support our, our clients and the training needs and the support out there. We've obviously got the academy now that's up and running. We've got the facility up in Alloa to support you guys with our engineers heading up by Munro up there. You know, from your point of view, do you see things like the academy here and further training sessions with your guys, etc., as a as a, a, a added value and a necessity going forward? The training support worked very well for us um, for, from the initial train the trainer style. So initially, I, c I can recall um, kind of overseeing some of the training that was delivered by uh, your colleagues at, at Ortis. We then used a kind of cascade training style, which involved some face to face training. Um, as I already mentioned, there was over 3,000 colleagues um, during nearly 500 training sessions across a, a huge number of places. All our training sessions, as you know, were quality assured by, by Ortis. And it was really good that you were able to adapt your communication and training methods to ensure that the types of projects such as ours are carried out thoroughly and productively. And, and I think that continues. I, I know that we have a number of um, online resources within AtSAS, which is our uh, service intranet. And there's some useful tools on there for colleagues to, to refer back to. Uh, for for training and, and equally for for new for new staff, so we're we're continuously recruiting. So there's always new people coming on board all the time. So I think the academy can only benefit that as we move forward, and it'd be exciting to see to see what you've got to offer. Good. Well, watch this space because there's plenty of things coming down the line soon with that. So that's good. This is a question that you can ignore totally. Feel free, but is there anything you want to ask me while we're sat here doing this about the project, the product, the company, etc.? So you've got your opportunity now. Oh, we've run out of film. Sorry. <laughs> I guess every good interview requires to, to to end a session on some questions for the for the panel. So yeah, I've got a few questions to throw back at you, Craig, but. I guess the obvious question though is how how do you think the, the 
they roll out wide. I mean, you've, you've, I guess, done this a few times before. Interesting to know what, what obstacles that maybe you had to overcome as an organisation or individually. But what did you do to do that? And have you had to adapt or is there any adaption planned within your business to, to alleviate any obstacles that you found in the future? We've done quite a few rollouts in the UK, it's fair to say, but none of the scale, as you just said. We've had national rollouts within Wales and we've had very big geographical rollouts with Yorkshire, east of England and obviously Wales. And we've had Northern Ireland to, to roll out as well. So a bit of everything that comes into the Scottish challenges. Uh, for me, the thing that was the most challenging was just pulling everyone together and to hit the numbers that you've mentioned because without the hardware coming in to the UK from Germany and without the engineers being available on site and without your teams doing what they were doing in terms of making vehicles available, it, it could have easily been a house of cards for us and it was a, a very logistical challenge in the ideal perfect world but when you throw in winter as we said earlier at the beginning of the project and then Covid at the end of the project it was very very tricky indeed to get it over the line but the patience and the logistical skill of your guys made it so that we could flip from one area to another very easily in the last end and the last parts of the project. Um, have we learned anything from this? I think yeah I think engaging with trainers and having regular project meetings like we did prior uh, to the rollout I think it was absolutely fantastic the team really really reacted well to it on all sides but I think in in regards to the what we've learned to take away from it I think engaging with the key people and the training teams within the trust is is absolutely paramount you know you you can't do this all on your own you've got to have buy-in from all elements of the of the service and the trust and it was a quite frankly for me it was a, it was a a pleasure to be involved in. It was a brilliant project and everyone here at Autos is extremely proud to be to be working with you guys up there. You know, it's a great ambulance service and to be providing such a key product and service, if you like, into you, it's something that I'm, I'm extremely proud of as the MD and as the, one of the founders of the company here and to see it flourish how it has gone with engineers and support up in Scotland, our Autos logo above the door in Alloa, it's amazing and yeah, it's, it's a great project to be involved in, really. Uh, thanks, Craig. And you're quite right. You should be proud to be involved with the best ambulance service in the UK. Absolutely. <laughs> Cut that. <laughs> well, no, listen, from my point of view, that's been a, a fantastic insight into you, the service, how you get over challenges, how you've got the product rolled out and what you think of it. So I want to thank you very much for, for your time and your honesty. It's been brilliant. And... Uh, I look forward to when we can have a chat face to face. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Uh, look after yourselves. Take care. Yep, and you, mate. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks again.